So my father has been in law enforcement my entire life. He went first from a military police officer in the army to a patrolman in the civilian life, to a detective, a sergeant, and then a lieutenant before his retirement last year. It was really interesting being raised in a law enforcement home. I was taught how to respond to cops, albeit from a white male perspective. I was always asked to make sure that I requested a lawyer before answering any questions and to make sure that everyone in the process knew that my father was also a cop. These techniques are ones that I've used in my past and they've served me well as a white male. Most of all, I learned at an early age that anyone, including myself, who found themselves in trouble with the law or perhaps even incarcerated, most likely deserved to be there. These learnings were seared into my brain at an early age, and they are what I believed even when I first started serving the incarcerated folks at the Solano County Jail as a volunteer assistant chaplain. Entering the jail with this attitude of us versus them or criminal versus legal caused a great deal of disruption in my heart. How was I going to be able to sit in spiritual communion with molesters and rapists, murderers and others who I had been taught deserve to pay for their crime? I had so many questions inside. Was I going to be able to do this and still continue to harbor belief that they deserved their punishment? I remember one such meeting last year that really touched my heart. A woman, let's call her Miss Ashby, entered the women's correctional library where I had been seated earlier by the guard. Hello, Miss Ashby, I said. My name is Chaplain Lemery. Would you like to have a seat? I motion to the wooden chair on the other side of the table, and she pulls the chair out and sits down. Now, as my practice is, I do not look up the rap sheets of the incarcerated folks I serve before or even after I meet with them. You see, I, I don't want my own internal biases to alter my ability to be with the person in their moment of joy or distress. After two years of volunteering at the Solano County Jail, you would think that I would be used to meeting with incarcerated folks, but this meeting was very different. You see, I wasn't there to deliver religious reading material, nor deliver the reading glasses that we sometimes give, and I wasn't there to hear a grievance, all of which are my normal tasks at the jail. Miss Ashby, I said, I'm so sorry to inform you that yesterday your grandmother died. She begins to cry hard, sobbing uncontrollably. I feel this intense desire to reach out and hold her as she wrestles with these feelings. But I'm not permitted to have physical contact with the inmates. So I acknowledge my own feeling and desire to calm her and I simply sit there and breathe. Additionally, I am instantly taken to my own grandmother's death and my intense sadness and Miss Ashby's sadness collide in this holy dance of chaplaincy. I remain silent and allow the sacred space to settle as we both welcome grief into the room. Once the crying subsides, Miss Ashby takes me on a journey of her memories of her grandmother and I am struck at how close Miss Ashby and her grandmother were. Her grandmother raised her from an early age, she tells me, and currently has custody of all of Miss Ashby's children. Her stories are full of love, and there are smiles and often laughter in some of the memories that she shares. Now, initially, I'm very confused inside. While I don't know her backstory of what brought her to the jail, at this moment, me and her together in the library, she seems so human, not the deserving bad person that I was taught frequents our justice system. 
At one point, Miss Ashby expresses great concern about being able to go to the funeral. This is a sentiment I completely relate to. In fact, all of the feelings that she has expressed are very much feelings that I understand. It's as if Miss Ashby and I are really not that different. As I said my goodbyes to Miss Ashby and walked back to my chaplain's office, I was very heavy hearted. Now, psychologists call this, this feeling I was having cognitive dissonance. It's a label used for those times in our lives where our experiences are at odds with our beliefs, or in my case, my early childhood development. As I tried to make sense of the experience, my heart was literally on fire. I needed to know more about Miss Ashby and what brought her here. So unlike my typical practice, I went into the inmate database and looked up the arrest records associated to her. Her familiarity with our county jail actually began when she was 18 years old. You see, she was arrested for stealing a three pack of women's underwear from a local Walmart. After that, Miss Ashby's rap sheet skyrockets in terms of volumes and number of arrests, all extending over 17 years of time. Now, none of her crimes were violent, and all of them are what I categorize now as crimes of survival. Seeing her in a moment of realness, this recognition of the loss of her grandmother and its impact on her, it really compelled me to understand what brought her here and maybe, just maybe, helped me understand why. Now, my impulse to know is actually related to a much bigger question about our justice system as a whole. Right now, most of our state and federal incarceration systems operate under the concept of retribution or payback. This focus is why my father taught me that people must be punished for crimes as it uses our justice system to answer questions like, what law has been broken? Who did it? What do they deserve? In trying to further my understanding and to satisfy this cognitive dissonance I was experiencing, I did a little research. And through it, I found that there are actually a number of alternatives to the retributive approach I described above. One such different practice is called restorative justice. Now, this mirrors some First Nations of North America, as well as the indigenous people of Australia's justice practices. Through it, the act of justice is refocused from a punishment-centered to a restorative center. One that asks questions like, what happened? Who was affected by it? And what should be done to try and repair the actual harm? The commonality in the many models of restorative justice that are out there is really this equal focus on the victim, the offender, and the community in which the offense was perpetrated. It's a completely voluntary and holistic approach aimed at truly righting a wrong. This type of justice seeking feels much more morally reparative to me. It seems to fit well within my own personal theology of the human soul. As a Unitarian Universalist, I deeply believe that all of us contain a spark of the divine. That is to say, we are born holy and complete, eternally loved. Miss Ashby didn't have an option for restorative justice. Instead, she was branded a criminal for stealing underwear and served punitive time in incarceration. Had her initial crime been responded to through a restorative justice lens, a meeting between the owners of the store, Miss Ashby, and the community representatives would have been convened and facilitated to attempt to repair the actual harm. I can't help but imagine what would have been her story had this happened. Perhaps, just perhaps, all involved would have seen that Miss Ashby stole the underwear 
only because the money that she received from her sex work went to use went to be used to pay rent for fa her family and she had nothing left for clothing. The community representatives and the store owner would have had the opportunity to see possibly with empathy and understanding that the choices the choices that led Miss Ashby to the behavior that damaged the relationship. Similarly, Miss Ashby would be asked to understand the economic harm that she did to the store owners. Collaboratively, the team would have worked toward reparations that satisfied all parties. Healing may have been possible without sending Miss Ashley into a system that seems to dehumanize and demean as a mode of punishment. This is an embodiment of my childhood understanding that if you find yourself in jail, there is something in your core that deserves to be there. For me, restorative justice has underscored a truth that continues to help me navigate my work with incarcerated people. This truth being that there is an absolute and clearly identifiable difference between personhood and behavior. For me, it is completely possible to acknowledge behaviors that harm without demonizing the person who perpetrates the injustice. In this case, Miss Ashby can fully retain her personhood as a beautiful spark of the divine. She's simply trying to find her place in this mixed up world, really just like all of us. Her past has led her to understand that some behaviors that others find harmful are acceptable for her in order to survive. As I packed my bag at the end of that day and made my way out of the secured area of the jail, I couldn't help but reflect on our UU values, especially our first principle that states that all are worthy of love and acceptance. I no longer believe that people deserve what they get in the punitive system of justice that we currently use. There must be a better way. One like restorative justice, where the hurtful behaviors in life are righted while honoring and preserving the inherent worth of the offender. What would our justice system, our congregations, or yes, even our entire denomination look like? if all of the wrongs that are committed were mitigated using restorative justice? What if we use this method in our personal relationships as well? What if it was the solution, the go-to solution for family conflicts or wrongs perpetrated in your family's school systems? What do you imagine your response would be to Miss Ashby if you were the store owner? in a restorative justice meeting? Could you hold her accountable for her behavior while remembering and honoring her inherent worth as a person? What if you were Miss Ashby? Would you remember that you were internally loved?